We are so delighted uh, to have this iconic filmmaker with us tonight to talk about his long-awaited memoir with our own Robin Young, co-host of Here and Now. Since 1962, as you all know, he has not only directed over 60 films, feature films, documentaries, short films. He's written the screenplays to all of them, as well as several books, including his first novel a year ago, The Twilight Zone. Thank you to our partners at Brookline Booksmith, who have Werner's memoir, Every Man for Himself and God Against All, for sale. He will be signing copies after this conversation, and you will want to buy this book. I've never read a memoir quite like it, because there is no one like Werner Herzog. It's mesmerizing. We will be taking your questions throughout the hour. Just go to slido.com and type in hashtag Herzog, capital H. Please welcome Robin Young and Werner Herzog. going to take us a second to get set up here. We have our things. Um, I, I had a chance to, I've had a chance to spend some time with Werner, delightful time uh, prior to speaking with all of you. And one of the things he said to me was, um, oh, well, you know, I'm really, I'm kind of over films. <laughs> but I, here's what I'm going to say to you, Werner. We're not over your films. So I am going to talk uh, something uh, about the films as well. But you are a poet who just happened to make films, you say. Well, <clears throat> in a way, as I'm sitting here, let's, let's focus on writing and poetry. It's strange because um, <clears throat> for decades now, at least 45 years, I keep preaching to deaf ears uh, that I'm a writer. And I published, for example, Off Walking in Ice when I traveled on foot from Munich to Paris because my mentor, an old Jewish woman, was dying in Paris. And I said, <clears throat> she's not going to be allowed to die. I will walk up against it. She didn't know that I was coming on foot. And I knew she would be out of hospital. So, um, and when this book was published, I said, uh, my prose is probably out going to outlive my films. And um, I'm totally convinced that there's something of uh, intensity in the style, in, the, uh, in my writing that um, is uh, different from what I do in, in movies. Well, it is obviously captivating you. And I will say, this book is just stunning. Uh, how, how many have read it? Or I know you're getting signed copies. Oh, no, in for a treat. It's, it's only out since Tuesday. Oh, so don't well, that, <laughs> that would have been a quick read. Yeah. So, okay. So how are Fabius Maximus, who saved Rome from Hannibal's army, Chef Alice Waters, The Simpsons, Twins Who Speak Simultaneously, Rodeo Clowns, the problem of making 400,000 ants stop in their tracks, face the same way, and wave their antennae? Hypnotism, the fact that Mike Tyson is a scholar on early Frankish kings, and Luther's 1545 translation of the Bible, a facsimile of which you carry with you. These are all in the same book. I mean, it's just, just I mean, like, head exploding. Yeah, it's just life. <laughs> Let's put it like well, this. for you, uh, maybe. Yeah, um, and, and it sounds odd, but uh, it was an image I had for Where the Green Ants Stream, a film I uh, did in Australia, where I saw a, a whole army of, of ants all lined up like, <clears throat> like under a magnetic field, some particles of iron. And they all are aligned and they're all facing all of a sudden and they freeze in position. And I wanted 400,000 ants and I made tests with ants, uh, but nothing worked. And, and when you cool them down uh, to uh, something like uh, two degrees Celsius, they start to slow down and they really, but they wouldn't align. And, uh, and then <laughs> if it's 
half a degree lower in temperature, uh, they they can't take it anymore. And uh, so I I dropped it because <laughs> I do the doable. I, it's easier to move a ship, a steamship <laughs> over a mountain uh, than having uh, ants uh, all <laughs> aligned and and looking in the same. Direction, <laughs> but it was a serious. It, it's I not. Know. It's not that I'm joking. It 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 was life. It was a project. It was a vision, and sometimes I cannot be fulfilled. And sometimes, uh, I thank God on my knees. Uh, I can write, uh, and I can explain it in a different medium, and that's that's what uh, the beauty is about uh, about poetry. You, by the way, are serious about all of that, everything I just listed. But I, let's just a little bit of the biography, because I loved reading about how this all started. You were born in Munich in 1942 uh, as an infant. You were in covered, the middle of a war. In the middle of the war. Yeah. As an infant, you were covered in Allied bombing rubble in your crib. And I thought, there it begins. I mean, just uh, right there. And your mom grabs you and your brother, uh, and you move to rural Bav Bavaria, uh, where you write your life was archaic, water from a pump, an outhouse or a bucket for human waste, terrible poverty, burlap sacks filled with dried ferns for mattresses, one loaf of bread for your mom and your brother for a week, crying from hunger. But also you write, it was a magnificent time. Yes, for all, for all the children who grew up in poverty in post-war Germany. And we always have this attitude to look at these children in ruins, playing in ruins and commiserating them. Uh, it's not correct because if you ask anyone, all, all my peers who grew up in the ruins in the cities, uh, look back at the time as, as the greatest, wonderful time they ever had. They were masters of bombed out blocks. They had adventures. They uh, had no drill sergeant at home who would tell them, the father who would tell them how to behave because the fathers were either dead or in captivity. It was the mothers who, who ran it. And, and we as boys immediately started to re-educate our mother. We, we had the feeling this was all old-fashioned and we had to take our destiny in our own hands. And from very early on, we took responsibilities and we had no toys, but we, we invented our toys. We invented our games. And uh, it, it was a wonderful, great uh, kind of childhood. Uh, with one exception, uh, when I was my earliest childhood memory is my mother in the middle of the night, and it was still very cold and still winterly, April, late April, 1945. She rips my older brother and me out of the bed at two in the morning or so, wraps us in, a, in, in two blankets and carries us up on a slope uh, just outside of the house, and there's the end of the valley, and she said, boys, I woke you up, you have to see this. You have to see it, look there. The city of Rosenheim is burning. So there was a allied carpet bombing on the city of Rosenheim, 40 miles away, 40 miles. And you didn't see the flicker of a, of a, let's say a house burning. It looks different, but as it was so far away and the entire city on fire, mm. it was a slowly pulsing light red and orange, slow pulsing at the at the horizon. And I never forget this image because I immediately got the feeling there's a world outside. I never had heard of the city of Rosenheim. Nobody ever spoke about it. I had no clue that there were cities. I didn't even know that what a city what a city was. I didn't know what a telephone was. I didn't know that cinema existed. Uh, Not for I, years. Until Not I was 11 or so, I didn't even know that cinema existed. So, but I, <clears throat> my first memory, I, I knew there was a world out which was foreign and dangerous, and there was such a thing as war. Um, and uh, it was awesome also to see it and, and this sense of awe and this sense of discovering never left me. 
Well, it was one of several scenes like that, that you, you just lay them out. There was Sturm Sepp, a giant of a man. He, he was bent at an angle uh, from carrying a tree. Uh, Farmer Stiegel Hands, who could lift the end of a truck with his Mr. Universe muscles. In a fight in a bathroom that you watched and all the men in the village watched, he rammed a man so hard into a toilet, the man's brow cut off and fell over his eye. Um, you saw a bicyclist attacked by a stag in heat. The slope behind your house was filled with weasels one day for no, yeah. express, uh, no reason. Mysterious because they don't do that. <laughs> lemmings, yeah, lemmings do that. They, they, they uh, congregate into hundreds or thousands. Weasels I've never heard and I... For a long time, I thought this is just a memory, and I shaped it, and I, and I asked the manuscript of the memoirs was sent to or given to both of my brothers, my older and my younger. My older brother, who has witnessed it with me, he remembers very, very precisely the same thing. So that's why it's in it. Otherwise, every single stone was turned upside, was turned around. Was this really like this? <clears throat> of course, uh, my siblings and uh, people who grew up with me could corroborate things. Sometimes I had a slightly different perspective, but the events were the same. And later, of course, in my life, yes, uh, uh, they are verifiable because so many people were there uh, during films, actors, uh, crews, extras, you, you just name it, dozens, hundreds sometimes, and, and you can't make things up. Or things that are completely grotesque. Uh, I was shot uh, once, not the only one, only time, but once I was shot <laughs> uh, during an interview and it was caught on tape. You still can see it on YouTube, I think. <laughs> this it's, is in Los Angeles. A, you're being interviewed by the BBC <clears throat> and you're shot. Folklore, folklore of Los Angeles, it's, a part of the folklore. It, it's astonishing. I mean, the things that you see, the things that happen to you, we'll get to more of that, but the things that you see, I want to, and you, you do, they're all true, but as a child, you were taken by a witch, but your mother got you back. Uh, yes, uh, that sticks in the mind of a child. <laughs> <clears throat> I think I, I was... <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, wait, do you want some water? Yeah, I'll there you have go. a sip of water. He was taken by a witch. And his mother went and got him back. Yeah. And it kept him from wetting his pants anymore. Yes, I think it was organized by my mother. <laughs> <clears throat> and she had a, an easy time to, uh, to catch up with the witch and persuade her to release me back in her arms because I would be more careful now with wetting my pants. <laughs> so... Must have been three years old or something like this, <laughs> the, yes. The and, and of course, uh, these things uh, stick uh, in your memories. And Or for example, I, I was sure I saw God. God had a brown overall and, and spots of oil on his chest. Uh, and it was Santa Claus stained in uh, Bavaria. Santa Claus is accompanied by a demon who rattles the chains and punishes uh, the bad children, and uh, we had some sort of idea we would trap uh, trap them and have a trip wire, so Santa Claus would would trip over it and fall into the kitchen where we all assembled and and his bag would fall on the floor, and the presents would roll out and so we we had this fantasy, but the closer Santa Claus day came, the more frightened we were. And now finally Santa Claus uh, arrives and his, the demon stamps with his hoof on the, on the floor outside. And, <clears throat> and I fled under a couch and uh, Santa Claus actually grabbed me and pulled me out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew this was the end. And all of a sudden <laughs> in the door I see, I see God who leans at the door and looks uh, at me and smiles at me and I, I knew I was rescued and I, I just took my stance and confessed that I had done bad things. And so it turned out that uh, God Almighty was an was a electrical worker. There was a tiny, <laughs> there was a small uh, turbine 
at the uh, at this torrent out there in in the ravine, and he kept uh, greasing it, and he heard the commotion. Ah, yeah, there was Santa Claus, and curious as he was, he just walked in and leaned in the door. For, but for me, it was clear this was God. Yes. Yeah, and, I mean, and it, it, was, oh, it was good that he was there. Well, well and I want to ask you uh, about God in a moment because we have a great question that's come in. But I just, you hear these images. I mean, it's, it's fantastical. And you say somewhere else later in the book, you just kind of toss out that you think that, and I'm sorry, I couldn't find it. There's just so much in there. But uh, you said something about how you think that uh, sometimes there are these images that are stored in our memory and then they get jogged out and maybe they become a film. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, there's the city on fire, lava, uh, weasels just filling your backyard, monkeys on a raft. Um, do you draw that? Do you, you know, the, the, these characters that you describe, uh -huh. these older men in particular, these these strong male characters who are kind of, crazed, feel like Kinski, you know, in many of his roles. D yeah. Did you pull from those scenes? Well, it's interesting that you bring it up because uh, some of it, yes. But but what you described now had nothing uh, to do. Weasel said I saw had nothing to do with, with uh, monkeys. 450 or so monkeys <laughs> the, that uh, um, overrun the raft of these demented conquistadors and take over and uh, uh, the last surviving man, Aguirre, uh, grabs one of the monkeys and starts to rave about his uh, wonderful kingdom and empire he will found with his own daughter in the purest dynasty. And of course, you know, they are doomed. But uh, other things that came back, for example, uh, windmills. I was on the island of Crete at the age of... 16, 17, and traveled on foot in the interior, in the mountains, not along the coasts. It's a long stretched island, high mountains, uh, and um, very strange, very archaic. And I had a donkey uh, who carried the water in some of my things. And all of a sudden I come to an edge in the terrain and I look down into a valley and there are 10,000 windmills. It's right. literally, it was, later I learned it's called, the, or it was called the, the Valley of the 10,000 Windmills. <laughs> and I, I was immediately struck, and like my grandfather, whom I only know, knew when he was insane at the end of his life. He was in dementia. I, yes, and I write about him. Uh, and uh, I thought... This is too early. I'm too young for being insane. Mm. And then I heard some creaking sounds and I uh, somehow collected my thoughts and, and I took a closer look and actually climbed down and there were really windmills. They there were, were for irrigation of water. And now I carried this image for, for a long time in me, years. And all of a sudden now in my first long feature film, it is a central metaphor. A, a German soldier who is wounded uh, and is put on a, on a quiet island where he doesn't have to face combat anymore. He becomes insane. At the moment he sees these windmills on a reconnaissance uh, trip. And uh, yes, these things appear. And you had so many of them. I mean, it's just astonishing the things you saw. Just astonishing. But you, you were talking about you thought you saw God. And, uh, of course, we have the title of the book, Every Man for Himself and God Against All, which is the German uh, translation of the title of the film, The Enigma of Caspar Hauser. And we have a question from someone in the audience, especially given this time that we're in this week. Yeah. Do you believe in any higher power or spirituality, or do you truly believe that all gods are against us? Well, I'm not here in a confessional so, um, but uh, I did have a very deep religious phase when I was an adolescence, adolescent, 
and I converted to become a Catholic against all odds because I knew uh, church hierarchy was a problem, church history in particular a problem uh, with witch burnings and with uh, uh, Spanish Inquisition and so on. And I, I, I had problems with uh, some key dogmatic questions. And um, still it, it f somehow dwindled away and left me, but I was... I felt a void of something uh, sublime, of something more transcendent. And uh, just to abbreviate, yes, I became a Catholic, <clears throat> but um, I, I'm not religious anymore. However, there is a distant echo in, in everything I do, in all these books, for example. There's, there's something which... Uh, touches something sublime, touches something like a, like a distant echo. And um, the way <clears throat> landscapes are described or situations, I'd like to give you a proof. Uh, I just uh, published a book before my memoirs, which is called <clears throat> The Twilight World. And I just read you, to you the Please. very first passage. The night coils in fever dreams. No sooner awake than with an awful shudder, the landscape reveals itself, itself as a durable daytime version of the same nightmare, crackling and flickering like loosely connected neon tubes. From daybreak, the jungle has twitched in the ritual torches of electricity. Rain. The storm is so distant that its thunder is not yet audible. A dream? Is it a dream? A wide path on either, on either side, dense underbrush, rotting mulch on the ground, the leaves dripping. The jungle remains stiff, patient, humble, until the office of the rain has been celebrated. The office of the rain has to be celebrated in the jungle. So you, you have the notion of something uh, of like creation in it. You have it in titles, for example, um, uh, the wrath of God. And in many, other, in many other titles, all of a sudden, God appears. And I don't know why and how. And I had a public discourse uh, <clears throat> not long ago, and it had the title um, Ecstasy and Terror in the Mind of God. It's a beautiful title, and you really get curious. And I didn't disappoint anyone. <laughs> yeah. Well, and by the way, this is why you get a little irritated when you are compared to German romanticists. And I hear you clearly because... This seething, you know, wrathful jungle and yeah. this, the, just the danger that lurks under most of your films, yeah. it's not romanticism. It's true, and you can see it, for example, in a documentary by Les Blank, where I'm uh, after some catastrophic things happened. We had two plane crashes. My camp for 800 extras <clears throat> was suddenly attacked because of... A border war between Peru and Ecuador broke out, and it was burned to the ground. This is the making of Fitzcarraldo. Making yeah. of Fitzcarraldo, and my leading character became ill. Jason Robards was flown out to the States and was not allowed by his doctors to return. And Mick Jagger, who was uh, on, on the, uh, one of the actors, a uh, main sidekick of the main character, and... Uh, I couldn't. I wouldn't stop him and hold him because he had to go on a world tour with a Rolling Stone. So I lost him out of the film, and and I had to take it every single thing. And then two days after uh, another catastrophe, uh, where our people, three of our people, were shot were with very t long arrows, uh, six feet long arrows, a man through the throat, a woman into the abdomen and three arrows uh, and, and wounded in a way that uh, you couldn't transport them any further and I uh, helped in 
the um, operation on the kitchen table in the jungle uh, with one hand illuminating with a torchlight the abdominal cavity of the woman who was operated and with the other hand spraying with a mosquito spray the clouds of mosquitoes away. So in two days later, let's say, speak about the jungle. And, and I say, well, uh, out this uh, jungle is not erotic, like Kinski always says. It is obscene and it's chaotic and hostile. And I see collective murder and asphyxiation and fighting for light uh, in the jungle. And I keep, I keep ranting against the jungle. And when you hear that, uh, you know that man is not romantic. No. And, uh, <laughs> I, I would like to give you another little proof. Please uh, do. Conquest of the useless. I was back uh, at the location where we pulled the ship over the mountain. Uh, and uh, um, I arrive at the village where a tiny native village of Machigengas and found two of the men who at the time I was doing the film wanted to kill Kinski for me. <laughs> and I had a conversation on camera with them. And uh, I describe how I returned into the village. It, it was midday and very still. I looked around because everything was so motionless. I recognized the jungle as something familiar, something I had inside me. And I knew that I loved it yet against my better judgment. Holy shit, yes. That's a <laughs> <laughs> Then words came back to me. Uh, it's very funny. Sometimes you probably have this experience that you have a, a melody going in your mind and you cannot get it out of, your, out of your system. And you wake up next morning and the melody is still there. And you drive in the car and it's still there. So um, I continue here. The, uh, against my better judgment. Then words came back to me that had been circling, swirling inside me through all those years. Harken, heifer, hoarfrost, denizens of the crag, will-o'-the-wisp, hogwash, uncouth, floatsome fiend. Only now did it seem as though I could escape from the vortex of words. Something struck me, a change that actually was no change at all. I had simply not noticed it when I was working there. There had been an odd tension hovering over the huts, a brooding hostility. The native families hardly had any contact with each other, as if a feud reigned among them. But I had always overlooked that somehow or denied it. Only the children had played together. Now, as I made my way past the huts and asked for directions, it was hardly possible to get one family to acknowledge another. The seething hatred was undeniable, as if something like a climate of vengeance prevailed from hut to hut, from family to family, from clan to clan. I looked around, and there was a jungle manifesting the same seething hatred, wrathful and steaming, while the river flowed by in majestic indifference and scornful condescension, ignoring everything, the plight of man, the burden of dreams, in the torments of time. Yeah. And see, so, your acceptance there, beautiful. And yeah, it's, what I'm hearing there is your acceptance. Because I just, uh, uh, off of the idea of God in your life, you never, in the reading, when, when we hear in the memoir, all the things that happen. You're having to operate on a woman and spray mosquito spray, all the things, the, the arrows, the, the infighting among the clans. You never you know, oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's more of a, wow, look at how the world is. It, yes, uh, and always with a sense of awe. And with a sense of awe. And I've got a question here. Sense so, of awe is always the beginning of poetry. And somebody asks, 
with all of the bleakness that you, is in your work and that you were just describing, how paradoxical, also a sense of wonder and hope. How do you maintain that sense of awe? Well, it's in me. Uh, how can I describe it? It has always guided me. It has always been uh, a, a driving force or the, the epicenter of, of my prose, of my poetry has been this sense of awe. In cinema, similar. Um, but let's forget about movies. They're only a distraction now. Um, well, actually... It's, but how did it come? Because my brothers don't have that. They grew up with me. The same poverty, the same experience, the same post-war years. But they are different, I don't know. Mm. So uh, I, I recognize that at an early age, very early age, and it was a very dense uh, few weeks at the moment where I decided to uh, to convert to Catholicism, at the moment I started to travel on foot, at the moment when I somehow knew I was a poet and there was a duty out there. So it's a sense of duty because I, I could see things that others did not see and I could articulate it. So that's that's what carries me. When, when someone asked you, what are you at one point, I can't remember what they wanted you to be, maybe film. You said, no, I'm a soldier. That sense of duty. Well, yeah, when, when people are pestering me, uh, like w once I was called by the Whitney Museum, they wanted me to participate with an art installation for their Biennale, and I said, I have, I'm, I have a very suspicious attitude to contemporary art, if you just look at the art market and the manipulation, manipulations, there's something wrong, profoundly wrong. And, and I have other arguments against all this. So, and, and they said, yeah, but you should be interested because aren't you an artist? And I said, well, I, I don't feel like an artist. And yes, but you're an artist, you're an artist. And I said, no, I'm a soldier and hung up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Actually, I did, I did an installation later, Hearsay of the Soul, uh, which was neither literature nor cinema. It was some, something outside of it. It was an installation about an, an early, um, or not that early, uh, uh, an artist from uh, Holland, Hercules Segers, early Rembrandt time, who created images, little prints that he made, so extraordinary that he was three, four hundred years ahead of his time, like the father of modernity. And it was an installation of images and of music. And uh, it became very, very popular. One of my most uh, successful things I ever did huh, as a soldier. A soldier. Um, I just want a little more of the storyline, uh, because your parents were so highly educated. They're just in the middle of this war. Uh, you talked about your paternal grandfather, Rudolf, an accomplished archaeologist. Your dad, a bit of a ne'er-do-well. Uh, you know, he left the family. But um, your mother moved you all, when you're about 13, I think, to, back to Munich to a rooming house and uh, enter stage left, as if on cue, this insane character, Klaus Kinski, who, you're 13, he's 26, he comes, the temper tantrums, the smashing of things. He's a boarder in this tiny little broom closet they had room for with him. What, I mean, it, it, it feels like a film or a stage play that when he enters your life. What did it feel like to you? No, it was a statistical anomaly. <laughs> uh, no destiny, no nothing. Uh, actually, a, an elderly lady ran this boarding house. She it, it, uh, had six rooms that she rented out, and there was one tiny room left that she gave to Kinski for free, who at that time was stylized himself as a starving artist. And um, <clears throat> he had um, somehow occupied uh, attic rooms nearby and filled it with, he, there was no furniture in it, he never liked furniture, he filled it neat deep with uh, dry autumn leaves 
and he would live there stark naked. <laughs> and when the, when the postman knocked at the door, he would rustle through the leaves and stark naked sign the receipt or something. And, and he was picked up from literally from the street by this lady, and I describe her very kindly. And, and he, from the first moment, he terrorized everyone. He would, for example, de destroy the only real bathroom for all the parties there and and lay waste to it, put everything into smithereens and scream inside. Be, I mean, you cannot imagine what he was capable of. And after a day and a half or so, emerge stark naked and uh, the entire bathroom was smithereens. Everything. And so what later, and, as an adult prompted you to hire him on your films. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, because I had seen a performance of him um, in a film in a very small in a very small role. And it was so extraordinary that I said to myself, I, I'll try to send this to him, the screenplay. I was very young. I wrote the screenplay when I was, uh, God knows, 24 or so. And um, of course, I knew he had broken contracts, had created scandals on stage. He had, in a stage play, I, th I think he had to play Hamlet, but never learned his lines and starts the first five lines of his uh, first soliloquy and so, and doesn't know the text anymore. And he starts to rave and rant at the audience because somebody was giggling or somebody was coughing. And he grabbed a, a Come the chandelier with burning candles and tosses it into the into the audience, and then rolled himself up in in a carpet on stage <laughs> and never reemerged until the theater was forced to to bring the curtain down. So that that was that was Kinski destroying sets of movies, and and I I knew I had to domesticate this this wild beast somehow. And I, I knew, even though I was a kid, I had it in me. I had it in me because I had a, such a clear vision. And the vision would carry him. And you know what happened? I sent this screenplay to him, and he hated screenplays. He hated directors. And at 2 in the morning, I get a call, a phone call, and I couldn't figure out what the hell is going on. There were unarticulate screams. <laughs> Uh, for 20 minutes on the other end of the line, and somehow I figured out this must be Kinski. <laughs> <clears throat> it turns out it was him, and he, he screams and starts raving and ranting. He says, that's the uh, best screenplay he's ever seen in his life. And I said, uh, Herr Kinski, Mr. Kinski, are we going to do this together? He said, and screams yes in a way, and kept screaming yes for three minutes. <laughs> Uh, and so I, I, I was silenced, and I thought, yeah, that's my man. <laughs> See, I think, I mean, I'm guessing here maybe, but, and you don't do, you doesn't seem like you're into this kind of analysis, but that's where I feel that having grown up with the guy who tears off somebody's brow in a toilet somehow h helped you uh, work with a man like Kinski. Well, there is no way to describe it. Um, and I survived five films, feature films with Kinski. No one else has managed anything <laughs> like this. You always, he made about 205 films. Nobody knows exactly. In spaghetti westerns, but he's normally there only for three minutes, which meant one day of shooting. There was no one, no one who could tolerate him longer than a day or two on a set. Then the actors in the crew would go on strike. So he had these short appearances. There's actually one spaghetti western where he plays a leading part. But most of the time he has a close-up in speaks and there was no partner. The partner had fled the scene <laughs> and he speaks to someone who waves a hand next to the camera. So he speaks to a waving hand. Uh, yeah, and uh, what can I say? I did wonderful stuff with him, but under real, real harsh conditions. And every gray hair uh, 
<laughs> on my head, I call Kinski. <laughs> um, you, you've spoken of awe, and um, uh, that you spoke, and you speak in the book about this beautiful grace, something that happens for you, where sometimes you don't even have anything to do with it, but you capture this thing, and um, there's this beauty, this awe that you capture. But you also talk about ecstatic truth, and I just want to move to that for a second because. As you said, you write, truth doesn't necessarily have to agree with facts. And this is where you make no bones about how you reject the kind of fly-on-the-wall cinema verite that was so popular, especially in American documentaries. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit more about that, about well, what, what, what is ecstatic well, truth? Well, the fly-on-the-wall cinema is a cul-de-sac. Uh, it doesn't get you anywhere. You we say are creators. You, want, you say you want to be a hornet. Yes, I want to be out there to sting because I'm a, I'm a creator, I'm a director. That's my profession. That's what I do. And that's why my films are, have more life in it. You see, uh, being a fly on the wall, uh, would they want to ask me to be like the, like the fly on the wall or the camera in the bank, uh, in the lobby of the bank? A security uh, camera. Because, <laughs> yes, the surveillance cameras, and, and they record nothing. They record 14 years and not a single bank robber shows up. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's just desperate. And uh, <clears throat> I, we have to be cautious because, <clears throat> because nobody of us knows uh, what truth is. The philosophers uh, cannot give an answer in their civil several different schools of thinking and there's no consensus and mathematicians cannot tell you but we have it in us we we are human beings we have it in us a quest for truth and somehow we know in which vaguely it must be somewhere out there and it's uh, it's like a dim light in a forest and there are lots of trees as an obstacle and for me, the, the search for it, the approaching it, the struggle for it, uh, all the toil that I have taken on my shoulders, uh, all this uh, uh, gives a certain meaning to what I'm doing. And it's a quest for truth. And of course, touch the term truth only with a pair of pliers. Um, and I always thought, why is it that facts quite often do not really illuminate you. And, and my example has always been, uh, the book of books would be the Manhattan phone directory, four million correct entries, every name correctly spelled, every phone number, every address correct, but it doesn't illuminate us. We cannot read it. And uh, there's something else in poetry. You, you stylize, you touch, deep into our sense of language, deep into something that uh, echoes all, all poetry of, of human beings. There's something in us. And, and all of a sudden, a, a book starts to illuminate you. A film starts to illuminate you. And only because you are departing from fact, 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 fact. And um, what I do quite often in uh, documentaries, for example, I stylize, I invent, I rehearse. It's all a no-no for Cinema Verity. They, they, if it's, it's abhorrent for them. And yet uh, the, the films I have made have a different, different inner light that shines in the audience for a long time afterwards as well. And um, of course I change... I change... Uh, facts and there's a wonderful uh, saying by a french uh, writer andre gide he said um, i modify facts in such a way that they resemble truth more than reality it's a very deep sentence we we need to have it sink in for a moment or uh, for me the easiest and best of all witnesses is uh, uh, Michelangelo um, and probably the greatest uh, sculpture that was ever created, the Pietà, which is in St. Peter's in Rome. 
the Virgin Mary is holding the body of the of Jesus taken from the cross. When you look in the, the face of Jesus, a 33-year-old man, a tormented face, and when you look in the face of his mother, the mother of the 33-year-old man is 15 years old, maybe 17. You have to take a guess. So my question is, did Michelangelo try to give us fake news? Did he try to lie to us? Did he uh, uh, mislead us, cheat us? No, of course he did not. By modifying the facts, by changing the facts, he gives us a deeper insight into the very essence of the man of sorrows and the virgin, his mother. And, and I, I feel so relieved that I have a witness on my side, somebody as, he, as, as if he had grabbed me under the arm and, and helped me out. Well, uh, we have a question from the audience. What is, though, the relationship between your notion of ecstatic truth and madness? You know, I mean, the madness of standing on the rim of a volcano, uh, to the, the madness of pulling a steamship up over the No, it mountain. is not man. Every grown-up human being, men in particular, should move a ship over a mountain <laughs> at least once in his or her life. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, but please, uh, I, I <laughs> didn't give an answer to this. Uh, what what was the question? What, what what is the relationship between madness, the sublime, and your notion of ecstatic? Oh well, well, we have to be careful because madness. Uh, uh, people think I must be mad doing things that others don't do, uh, but in the film business, in in the film industry, I I truly am the only one who is clinically sane. <laughs> All the uh, what else you see is kind of of, of uh, mad or stupid or uh, not very healthy and not very sane. Um, I, I would be very cautious because uh, when we speak of the ecstasy of truth, it is more like a, a, a feeling like uh, m late medieval mystics had in their faith an illumination. And ecstasy means in ancient Greek, ekstasis, to stand outside of yourself, to step outside of yourself and experience um, the world or God or faith in a way that uh, you cannot do otherwise. You have to be ec ecstatic uh, to experience and to become illuminated. So it has these connotations in it. Uh, and... Uh, I can't really f explain it that much further. We don't have the time. By the way, after this book, after the memoirs who uh, were published only two days ago, I wrote yet another book, which is called, it has a, a good title, The Future of Truth. And in this future of truth, which is furious storytelling also, but there is a chapter about the ecstasy of truth. So I, d I go more into detail there. Does ecstasy include pain? I'm thinking of Not some of the... Not necessarily, no. Well, here's some of the things that have happened to you, and this is a short list. You mentioned that you were shot doing an interview in Los Angeles. Um, there was also dysentery. You were in civil wars. Um, and by the way, we mentioned that you were shot, and then just minutes later, you turn around and rescue Joaquin Phoenix uh, from a car accident, he's hanging upside down in the car. So just, I mean, just in the space of a few moments, you have those two experiences. But you're stranded in a blizzard on a mountain. You almost drown. The Times, the New York Times reviewer, Dwight Garner, calls you the world's most grand, eloquent crash test dummy. <laughs> yeah. But is pain part of the ecstasy or Not no? Not necessarily because I'm a professional. And you see the... The New York Times reviewer, he was just stunned and puzzled and I think really dazed and confused. Uh, and you know, he he's doubts, coming here in doubt, a few weeks. I'm going to ask him. Beautiful, about yes. And, and please tell him that he says, ah, oh, yeah, he did a stunt in a theater like a stuntman. 
I have a sequence of photos. What happened is I wanted during a staging of an opera, during the overture, I wanted to have the curtain open and all of a sudden a stage worker apparently falls from very high up uh, and it was a mountain, a cliff of a mountain. And on the floor uh, with dry ice clouds and somebody falls bang through and disappears in the clouds. That's what you wanted. That's what I wanted. And, and I wanted the conductor to hesitate for a moment and the audience would be puzzled. Was this a, 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 an accident? What, what the hell happened here? So in the theater said, no, this is too dangerous and we don't uh, have money for a stuntman. I said, let me try it. Maybe for the opening night, for the premiere, I'm going to do that stunt. And we got a huge air cushion. No, I'm not, I'm not a fool. Like uh, stuntmen in, in Hollywood, they use very large air cushions. And I had myself lifted higher and higher up and dropped down. And at the end, from really high up, from something like 50 feet, 45 feet high, I come down and I kind of sprained my neck a little bit. In that moment, I said, no, this is not doable. It's stupid. I, I'm not doing it. And if you're a guest here soon, tell him if he wants the photos, the photo proof, a sequence of photos, I can send it to him. Well, I don't know if you guys the have... The disbeliever. I dis well, I, I actually thoroughly enjoyed the, the review because he's just so incredulous. At one point he says, so go ahead and, uh, so I'm paraphrasing, go ahead and read uh, Werner Herzog's uh, new book, but check for your wallet. <laughs> because he just thought, can this be true? And somebody had asked about that. It went by. Yes, that's asked, the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it that I lived a life like no one else. So in my my. The way I write is also different because it is informed by a worldview and the worldview is informed by events in my life and my, my brushes and contact with the real world, with reality, with the jungle, with the mud, with uh, uh, being with an elite uh, troop of child soldiers and coming under attack. Yes, uh, this is an unusual thing for a filmmaker or for a poet. Um, and because of that, the, the writing is in a way different. And um, you see, when you live in New York, you are in a strange reality. It's a separate reality where hardly anyone is left after 10 years who doesn't need to go to the psychiatrist. <laughs> Well, but so, I also and, thought and those people are, st are, are become incredulous. Well, but I also yeah. thought there's a cottage industry of people who pay people a lot of money to try to get a fraction of the life experiences that you you've had. And I'm, I'm, one of the things that startled me, knowing all the images you've seen, I and I thought, well, God, how come I haven't seen those things? Maybe I didn't notice things. Maybe they were there and I didn't see them. Or uh, but then you say, you don't dream. How do you uh, not that dream? That is actually true, yes. I'm the proof. Because uh, you see, you have this school of academia in, uh, in, in psychology or psychiatrists. Or so they would tell you every human being dreams so and so much during night. I do not. I'm the living proof. Just put some uh, measurements on my head. And, and you will get a flat line and no dream at all. <clears throat> and I wake up in the morning and I, I think uh, I feel, it feels like a void. I have not dreamt. But I do have, it's, it's, not, it's only partially uh, true. I do have dreams, but daydreams. And in particular, when I travel on foot, when I walk on foot uh, over, let's say, a, a long distance, I don't know, a thousand kilometers or so. I walk through whole novels. I walk through whole uh, greatest football games that ever were played, and I'm a player on the field. So it's, uh, it's, it, it occurs to me, but in a different way. I do that too. I, I make up stories all the time, and I have to stop myself. Like, wait, stop, that's not really happening. And I think maybe, maybe the rest of us dream, because we're trying to get those phantasmagoric images 
those incredible, you know, operas that play out in your head, and and you don't have to because you 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 have seen them. Yeah. I I guess uh, our time is our time is is, is uh, wrapping up, but a couple of quick questions. Um, oh, first of all. You began doing the narration for your documentaries. You talk about this in the book, and you talk about how uh, if you go online, there's this whole um, genre of people trying to sound like Werner Herzog. Yeah. Do you listen to them? My, my doppelgangers. <laughs> well, let them be out there, yes. Uh, most of them are lousy. Uh, in fact, uh, artificial intelligence has created a better, more convincing replica of my voice. Then they There's a, a permanent discourse I have with a Slovenian philosopher. It goes endless. It goes for the next 400 years, if you want to listen yes. in. But it's all mimicry of dialogue. But the accent is, I mean, my accent is, is crazy, and, and I know that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do not, I can't improve it anymore. I, it's it's what, what I am. And, of course, it has uh, uh, attracted a lot of uh, imitators. It has uh, attracted strange awe. Yeah, Can somebody really speak English like I do? And I do it in my commentaries in um, films and also in, in discourse or in, in, in normal life or in the commentaries of films or in the writing, there's always some sort of a almost hypnotic element in it. And uh, that's part of what, what I have done in one film, for example, the entire cast, all the actors, play under hypnosis. It was a situation of a village community in the 18th century uh, that lapses into a collective uh, sleepwalking in trance and they walk into a into a disaster that is described and foreseen by a prophetic cowherd and i thought how would i stylize these people in trance walking into into their doom and i thought maybe they should be really under hypnosis and i had a hypnotist for the first two casting sessions and he was such a such an idiot i couldn't take him any longer <laughs> And and I had to do it myself. It I, became it, the, yeah. you hypnotized yes. everyone. And, and there's a, a specific way to to speak with a certain intensity and a certain um, there's a certain authority also in in the voice. And and there's this very distant echo of that in my um, public speeches, uh, like the commentaries in uh, the documentaries, and you hear. Sometimes you hear the tone, you hear the tone in the writing. Yeah. Well, just getting back to those videos, uh, have you seen the woman who has a whole series? It's um, sad fill-in-the-blank children. No, a sad fill-in-the-blank clothes for sad fill-in-the-blank children series. So sad beige clothes for sad beige children. And they purport to be your clothing line for kids. Uh-huh. <laughs> And I googled, and people think it's real. Uh, they it's, think that uh, you I have think a... the the whole idea of me uh, doing a clothesline is pretty stupid. <laughs> I wouldn't, uh, but whatever. I mean, the, uh, and but there's nothing wrong about them about it. Let let them do it. They are my unpaid stooges, <laughs> my bodyguards out there. It is who hilarious. Do, yeah. The children and, are the saddest looking children in the saddest beige clothing with a Werner Herzog. Yeah kind of narrative to it. Yeah, and, um, and for example, I, I did a film in Antarctica, and before I came back to edit the film, there was already a satire out, or a parody of my film that didn't even exist, was out on the internet. So uh, I got acquainted to it, let, let it be, uh, and a little bit of self-irony is not bad at all anyway. Uh, one last question, and then we're going to get you all out uh, to the lobby where the books are there to be signed. I'm not going to give away too much here. I'm just going to say, when you read the book, pay attention to the forward and the last part of the forward and think of it when you get to the very end. Um, But having said that, without giving it away, what kind of happens is you get distracted by a hummingbird. And 
all I could think of in that moment, and forgive me because I'm, I'm a huge fan and I, I love these books, um, but all I could think of in that moment is the movie Up, where the dogs are all going, dog, 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 and then squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. <laughs> you know, that you just are so um, taken by everything around you. And I wonder, is, is part of um, what happens for you that I, I imagine you, you can't maybe stand being bored or um, you know, afraid of being normal in some way? No, I don't know what normalcy is. No. I believe I'm the most normal of them all. <laughs> and uh, what, what uh, my existence is, yes, I absorb the world with intensity and curiosity and awe. And in a way, it sometimes a decade later, it returns and it returns in, in a different shape. And it returns... Uh, in um, a poem, or it returns in a description of the jungle, or it returns in the way I would uh, write about something, or in a film sometimes. But at the moment, uh, I, I have to say, yes, I'm a writer, I've always been a writer, and people are puzzled here, how do I reconcile it? Very easy, I have a simple answer, simple formula now, and nothing beyond it. Films are my voyage, and writing is home. So we are at home right here. Hmm. Werner Herzog, where are we all going now? Can we go with you? <laughs> Wherever you go. Thank you so much, Werner Thank Herzog. in the lobby. I think there's going to be a line. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. And if you do want to see Robin interview the aforementioned New York Times book critic, Dwight Gurner, please sign up for our newsletter for all things happening. He's coming on November 7th to talk about his memoir.